Now that we have Adobe Illustrator set up for a web design workflow, it's time to turn our attention to actually creating some web graphics. In this module, we're going to explore the process of developing individual web graphics. Now this could be an icon or a logo or some other singular design element that is used on a web page or within a mobile application. As I mentioned in an earlier clip, this is a more traditional role for Adobe Illustrator as a design tool. We will explore other methods of using Illustrator as a web design tool in future modules. But for now, we're going to focus on creating a document for designing individual web graphics. Then we'll create our first and perhaps the most common web graphic, a button. We'll also take a look at setting text within Illustrator by adding a label to our button and create a standalone text graphic. I'll show you how to create more complex graphics using tools exclusive to Illustrator that'll make the whole process much easier. And finally, we'll wrap up this module by exporting all of the graphics we create in various formats for delivery to our web developer. So if you're ready, let's get started by creating a new Illustrator document for our web graphics. Let's begin by clicking on the new icon here to open up the new document dialog box. And across the top here, we want to go ahead and select either the mobile or the web category here. Now I'm going to start with the web category. And the real reasoning behind that is that when you choose either of those two categories, Illustrator is going to go ahead and turn on all of its web specific features, all of that good stuff that we need for the web. Well, that's going to get turned on automatically for you. But as far as picking an actual document preset, I'm going to leave that up to you. So you could, if you are still in the early design phase here and you want a, a little bit of a room or canvas to kind of play around with, you could choose one of these like larger sizes, like this web large. And then you just have a really large canvas in which to develop your graphics. And I have to admit, I've done this several times myself and I, I kind of like the freedom that it gives me, especially, like I said, when you're in that early design phase, that discovery phase. But if you already have a pretty good idea of the graphics that you're going to create, at least down to a rough size, you might want to start with a custom uh, document size. So once again, as long as you start with either the mobile or web category, Illustrator is going to turn on all of those web specific features in the background, but you can choose a custom width and height over here on the right in the preset details. So I know that I'm going to create some button graphics here, and I have a rough idea as to the size of those graphics. So let me go ahead and create an artboard that is based on that size. Now, I also know that my buttons are going to have different appearances or states. So I have a normal state when the button's just sitting there, and then I also have a hover or over state when the mouse hovers over it. When you press the button, I want it to change again. And then if the button is disabled, I want it to look different. So that's, you know, four different appearances or states. And I want to create an artboard for each one of those states. So I can do that right here. I'll just go ahead and toggle this up to have four artboards. Now, by default, it's going to stagger these kind of in a zigzag motion. So I'm going to go ahead and choose the more settings option down here. And then we can change the spacing between those and then the uh, layout of those. So the spacing between them, I'm just going to go ahead and crank that up a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go to like 60 pixels. And then I'm going to choose this arrange by column. So I'm going to get a single column straight up and down. The rest of the settings I'm going to leave as they are. And I'm just going to go ahead and click the create document button here. So here we can see our four artboards here. Now, they're not all fitting in the screen and they're not actual size, and that's okay. I'm going to zoom out so we can see all of these. Now, if you wanted to use the keyboard shortcut for this, it's Control-Alt-0 on a PC or a Command-Option-0 on a Mac. And then what that does is it will zoom out to show all artboards on the screen at the same time. Now, if you're not into keyboard shortcuts, then just go up to the View menu. And you'll see here, uh, fit all in window. That means fit all artboards in window. And what that's going to do is zoom it out enough to fit all of them in there. Now, the only problem with this is that this is not actual size. 
So if I want to see how large these artboards are, you know, when they publish to the web, I want to go back up to that view menu and I'm going to choose this option, actual size. As you can see here, actual size does not recenter all the artboards in the document window. Actually, what it's going to do is recenter the main artboard, the one that I have targeted, which is the first one. It's going to recenter that in the screen. So if I want to see all of them here, what I can do is I can use a scroll wheel on my mouse and just scroll down a little bit to see them all. So there we have it. Our four artboards ready for our four different states of our button. And we're going to... Here are my four artboards for the four different states of my buttons. Now, to start creating the buttons, I'm going to go over to my toolbox here on the left, and I want to select one of my shape tools. Now, I'm going to click and hold on the shape tool here, and I'm just going to use the tear off here to create a new little shape toolbox. And this way, I can very quickly uh, jump between the different shapes that I want to work with. Now, I'm going to start with the rectangle tool. And within Illustrator, you draw in one of two ways. One is dynamic. That means I just click and drag and I can draw out a shape, whatever dimensions that I want. And that's fine when you're kind of in an experimental phase. But if you want to draw something specific, you can draw mathematically. Now I'm going to delete this by just hitting the delete key. And if I instead just click with my shape tool, it's going to give me a dialog box. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mouse over the top left edge of my first artboard here. And because my smart guides are turned on, I'm going to see this option that says intersect. And that lets me know I'm in the right spot. I'm right there intersecting with the top left corner of my artboard. So I'm going to click once and release, and I'm going to get this dialog box. And now I can plug in the exact value for my artboard here. So I want this to be 142 pixels wide. I'm going to hit the tab key to jump down to the height field, and this should be 44 pixels tall. I'll click OK, and there we have it. So now I want to fill this with some color. And since the website that this is going to go on is more of a outdoorsy, kind of a camping and fishing, all that kind of stuff, it's all about that lifestyle. So I want to use kind of earth tones here. And to help you out with this, I have created a swatch set for you. So if I open up my swatches panel over here, you can see I've got some earthy colors over here. I've got some greens and some oranges and then a couple of grays. And so this particular button, I want to start with kind of a medium green color for the fill. And then I want to put a dark green border on it. Now at the top of my swatches panel, I have two small icons, these two little squares here. The square towards the bottom represents the stroke value. And notice how it's in front of the other square. Now the other square represents the fill property. So what I want to do is I can choose the fill or the stroke. Now the stroke is in front. So that means whatever I select here in the swatches panel will be applied to the stroke or border of the object that I have selected. So I want to use a dark green for this. So I'm going to use this really dark green down here. Just click on it once to apply that. And then to switch to the fill color, I just simply go up to the fill icon here, click it once, and now you can see it has moved to the front. And I'll just choose this medium green for the fill color. Now let's create the second state of our button here. To do this, I'm just going to replicate the box that's already here. So I'm just going to grab my selection tool mouse over my little box, and then I'm going to hold down the Alt key. Now this would be the Option key if you're on a Mac, and your cursor should change to two little arrowheads. Now I just simply click and drag and drop this box onto the next artboard. I release the mouse, release the Alt or Option key, and now I have cloned this first button. Now for this button, it's going to be a hover state, so I generally like to have these types of hover effects like lighten up the color of the button. So I have a lighter green here and I'm just going to adjust that to the fill. So now I can see that, yeah, there's a definite difference here between the two. I think that's going to look really good. Well, let's go ahead and create the third and fourth one here. So if you want, you can clone this one using the 
alt or option drag method like I showed you before. That to me seems to work the best. Or you can just click and drag over it if you'd like. So I've created my third state here. Now this is going to be the active state. And so for this one, I really want to change the color. So I'm going to go way off the reservation here. I'm going to use this bright orange for the fill color. And then for the stroke color, I have a slightly darker orange. And what that's going to do for me is really show my audience that, hey, this is the active button. So if they are viewing this on a tablet or a mobile device, this is really handy because when they tap, they will get this little flash of orange and it'll let them know that, yes, they did indeed tap or interact with that button. Now, obviously on a mobile device, there's not going to be a hover state. So this is only for uh, our interactions with a mouse. But still, it's an important thing to have. Well, the final state here is going to be the disabled or the grayed out state. So once again, you can use your rectangle tool, maybe just click and drag out the shape if you want. Or if I delete that, you could use the selection tool, grab one of these other shapes, and then alt or option drag it right on top of the new artboard there. And there you have it. So we'll just change the fill color and the stroke color. So the stroke color for this, I think, is going to be this kind of darker gray here. And then the fill color is going to be... In the early days of web design, there was a lot left to be desired when it came to text. Web browsers only supported a handful of fonts, and none of them were very attractive. They were selected for their readability and availability across a broad range of web browsers. Now, This core group of what is known as web-safe fonts is still available today, but thankfully, there are ways to expand your website's typography. Now you can actually embed fonts into your website with just a little extra coding. Font hosting services such as Google Fonts and Adobe's Typekit have allowed web designers to select fonts that fit their designs and ensure that their end user sees those same fonts in their browser. Let's continue with our button graphic from the previous clip and add a text label using a font from Adobe Typekit. This document just contains the four different states of our button. And so now we want to add a text label to this. Over here in the layers panel on the far right, I don't want to disturb the button graphics that are already here. So I'm going to click on this little space right here beside the eyeball to lock this layer. In order to add the text, I'm going to create a new layer. So I'll go down here to the bottom, click create new layer. Now I'm ready to start setting my text. So I go over to the left and in my toolbox on the far left hand side, the fourth tool from the top is the type tool. Now I'm going to select that and there's other tools in here, but we're not going to bother with those for now. We're just going to stick with the standard type tool. Next, I'm going to mouse over my first artboard here and I'm just going to click somewhere here near the center of that artboard. Now I'm using a newer version of Adobe Illustrator and so one of the features that they have included is this lorem ipsum. If when you click on your artboard here, you don't see the lorem ipsum. It just means you're using a slightly older version of Illustrator and you're gonna be getting a blinking cursor there. So you're ready to start typing. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna type the message here. So I'm gonna turn on my caps lock here and I'm gonna put in get outdoors. Next, I'm going to click and drag over that text I just set to highlight all those characters. And I'm going to go up to my control panel. Now, because I'm working with text, my control panel is going to give me information about that text. And one of those things is things like the font, the style of the font, and the size of the text that I'm using here. So I'm going to choose a different size. I'm going to click this drop down here and we can see the preset sizes. So I'm really looking for 16 pixels, but I don't see that here. I have 14 and 18. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select 14. And then I'm going to use these little arrows here. I'm going to click the up arrow twice to get me my 16 pixels. And this is a good standard size for button text. 
You could, of course, select any font size that you want. Next, I'm going to reposition this text. So I'm going to just go back over here to the left. I'm going to grab my selection tool. And you'll see that my text has this little bounding box around it. So I'm just going to mouse over towards the center, over where the letters are, and just click and hold and drag. This way I'm not resizing my text accidentally. And I just kind of center it up as best I can here. Now, what about the font itself? If I look up here at the top in my control panel, it's still relatively the same. I still have my character controls because it understands that the object I have selected is text. So what about a font? Now I'm going to click this drop down here and we'll see all of the fonts that I have available to me on my computer. But now not all of these fonts are going to be available out on the web. So my audience is not going to have all of these same fonts. So whatever I choose in here, I want to choose something that would be available online as well. And in the old days, we would have been stuck with just a handful of fonts. But fortunately today, we have a lot of options. So one of those options is right here. It's called Typekit. And there is an Add Fonts button here. And I'm going to just click on this. And it's going to open a web browser. And now I'm taken to the Adobe Typekit website. Down the right-hand side, you have some filters here. So if you know, well, I want to use a slab serif, and I want to use this for a heading, then it'll help you sort through the various fonts. Now, I have two fonts that I've already chosen for this project. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll up here to the top. And in the upper left-hand corner, there is a search field. So the two fonts that we're searching for, the first one is called Rucksack. I'll choose that. And we'll see the details for this particular font. There's different versions of this font. There's a light, book, medium, demi, bold, and black. Now, I've already synced to my uh, Creative Cloud applications the book and medium versions. So if you'd like, go ahead and click the sync button to the right of those two fonts. In the background, Adobe will start downloading these fonts to your computer. Now the other font, let's just scroll back up here to the top. And in the search field, we're going to type in Rogue. And we're going to choose the Rogue Serif. Once again, I'll scroll down, and in this case, I want to sync the bold version of this font. So go ahead and click the sync button there and sync these fonts. Now I'm going to jump back over to Illustrator. The Adobe Typekit service is amazing, and it's usually pretty fast, but occasionally it gets slowed down. There's a lot of requests there, and so sometimes you have to save your program, quit out of it, and then relaunch the program in order for those fonts to show up. Other times, they just almost instantaneously show up in your character panel. So since I've already have mine loaded and synced, if I go up here to my uh, control panel and I click my font dropdown, I want to find those fonts. Now, I do know that they are from the Adobe Typekit. So there is a small black and white TK icon right here. And if I click on that, it's going to filter these results based on what I have synced with my Adobe Typekit. And sure enough, there are my two new fonts. So I'm going to choose the Rucksack version here, and I am going to use the Book variant here. So the font is looking pretty good. I'm not crazy about the color though. So the default here is black. So I'm just going to change that. So with my text still selected, I'm going to open up my Swatches panel, and I'm going to choose white for this first version. And then I'm just going to clone this down onto the other states. So once again, I'm going to use the regular selection tool. I'm going to hold down the Alt key on a PC. That's the Option key on a Mac. I'm going to mouse over this text. I'm going to click and hold and drag this straight down and clone it. And then I'll just do that again. And one last time. Next, I'll just choose different colors for the text. So this last one here, this is kind of the grayed out state. I just want to choose a color that's slightly darker than the background. Perfect. For the orange one, I think I'm going to choose a really dark gray for this one. Nice. And then for the light green here, I'm actually going to use that same dark green color that we used on the border earlier. Nice. 
We have just scratched the surface of what you can do with text. In a later module, we'll explore some of the other text features that Illustrator has to offer. Now in the next clip, I'm going to show you how to save time creating complex graphics with a tool exclusive to Illustrator. Eventually, you will have to create graphics that are a bit more complex than just polygons and ellipses. Now you could attempt to freehand draw these graphics using Illustrator's pen or pencil tools, but I think you'll find yourself mired down in the fine tuning of anchor points and handles. Now that alone is enough to drive anyone mad. However, the process doesn't have to be so frustrating or time intensive. Let me show you how I approach creating complex graphics and maintain my sanity in the process. For our complex graphics project here, I wanted to show you what we're going to build. So on the left, we have the completed project. It's a little backpack graphic that we'll use in our website. And to the right here, you will see that same backpack, but this is the limitation of the shape tools that we have available to us in Illustrator. So this is as far as we can take it with just the basic shape tools. So how would we create something like the scalloped edge of the backpack lid and the little pocket here? And then also the little edges that we see here on these pockets. Well, that can get a little intimidating if you're trying to trace that or draw that using the pen and pencil tools. You're going to spend a lot of time trying to get those arcs and those curves just right. Let me show you a little bit easier way to do this. First, I'm going to zoom in on the backpack to the right. So I'm going to grab my zoom tool. I'm going to mouse right over the center of that. And I'm going to click, hold, and drag to the right and then release. So dragging to the right with the zoom tool will zoom in. Now this is because I have the scrubby zoom feature turned on. If you click and drag to the left, you zoom out. So to the right zooms in, to the left zooms out. Very powerful little feature. Glad they added that to Illustrator. Now, the next thing I want to do is take a look in the Layers panel. In the Layers panel, I have separated out our graphics here. And I want you to click on the Disclosure Triangle for Backpack. And that's going to reveal the other layers that are on this Backpack layer. There's a Details layer, and I want you to poke the eyeball for that to hide that layer for right now. Next, I want you to toggle on the visibility of the Shapes layer. So we click here where the eyeball should be, pops open, and we can see there are three circles here. Now, note that the circles are overlapping here, and that's important. Because what we're going to do is we're going to use these three circles and this rectangle here in the background to create this more complex shape. I'm going to go over to the left and I'm going to go and grab my selection tool out of my toolbox. I'm going to select those three rings. Now to select multiple objects, you hold down the shift key as you click with the selection tool. So I've selected those three rings and I'm going to shift click on this large rectangle here in the back. In case you grab something that you didn't intend, all you have to do is just continue to hold the shift key and click on the object that you didn't intend to click on and it will deselect that object. So the shift key will add to your selection and remove from your selection. All right, so we have our basic shapes selected, the rectangle and the three circles. Now we want to use the shape builder tool to create this complex shape. And this is really, really quick and easy. All I'm going to do is go over to the left and about halfway down my tool panel on the left hand side, you're going to find the shape builder tool. I'm going to click on that to target it. And the shape builder tool only works on objects that are selected first. So I can't use it on any of the other graphics that we see here because they're not selected. But when I mouse over the graphics that are selected, you're going to see this weird little pattern emerge. And that's just kind of an indicator as to what's about to happen if you interact with this object. So I'm going to mouse over the top edge of the backpack. And you can actually see that textured area. Well, that looks like the shape that we're after. So you're just going to click once with the Shape Builder tool. That's it. Now, the top of the backpack disappears. Don't worry about that. It's still there. It's just removed its fill color for right now. Next, we're going to go back over to the left and we're going to grab the regular selection tool. We're going to click here in the background to deselect everything. And then over in the layers panel, we're going to turn off that shapes layer. So just poke the eyeball and they'll disappear. 
Now, just mouse over the edge of the backpack. Now, if I'm mousing here in the top edge here, I'm not seeing anything as far as the top half of my backpack. But if I move a little bit to the left, where the left edge of the backpack used to be there at the top, or if you mouse near the top, you will find the edge and then it'll highlight. So as soon as it highlights, just click on it to select it. And now we're going to sample another color. So with this object selected, I'm going to go over to my toolbox. Down towards the bottom left-hand side of the toolbox, there is an eyedropper tool. You're going to grab that eyedropper tool and you're going to mouse over this bottom rectangle here, this dark green one, and click. And so what it's going to do is sample those properties and put them in the object that you had selected. we got a couple more things we can do here with the uh, shape builder tool. So let's take a look. First, I'm going to zoom in on this pocket here on the left. So I'm going to grab my zoom tool again, and I'm going to just mouse over the center of that pocket and click and drag to the right. Next, I'm going to go back over here to my toolbox, and on the right-hand side of the toolbox, the fourth tool from the top should be the line segment tool. I'm going to grab that line segment tool, and I'm going to mouse over the right edge of this little pocket. Now I have my smart guides turned on, so it's telling me that I'm right on the path. If you don't have your smart guides turned on, you can find that in the view menu down towards the bottom. I am going to click and drag down and to the left. Now it doesn't matter the angle, just whatever you feel comfortable with. And I just want to make sure that I'm going all the way to the leftmost edge of the shape. Now you could go beyond it. That's fine. And in fact, I'll do that in this exercise just so you can see what happens. The main thing here is to have this line bisecting this shape. Next, I'm going to go back to my regular selection tool. Now note that my line remains selected. See the little handles on it? It's still selected. So I'm just going to hold the shift key and I'm going to click on the uh, pocket rectangle here. Now both items are selected. Let's grab our Shape Builder tool. And with the Shape Builder tool, I'm just going to mouse over the top edge of this little pocket. I see the textured area, and I'm going to click. Now, once again, it's going to disappear just like the top edge of the backpack. That's okay. Now, what do we do about this extra little piece here? We still have this little line coming out here, and we really don't want that. The Shape Builder tool works in a Merge mode and a Subtract mode. So, I need to put it in a subtract mode to remove this line. If you're on a PC, hold down the Alt key. If you're on a Mac, hold down the Option key, and you'll see that your Shape Builder tool now has a minus sign beside it. And if I mouse over this little line, it turns red. When I see that, I'm going to click, and it removes that line. Let's just grab our Selection tool. Let's deselect by clicking out here in the background, and then mouse over just the edge where the top of that pocket was. Click to select it. Then grab your eyedropper tool and sample the dark green color again. We're going to zoom out a little bit. So I'm going to grab my zoom tool. I'm going to zoom out by dragging to the left. And then I'm going to grab the hand tool to recenter my graphics. Now the hand tool is not moving the graphics. It's just moving the focus of my screen. So it's kind of like an interactive scroll. Now what about the pocket here on the right? We could do the same thing. We could go through that same operation, but Really, to keep it consistent, what I'm going to do is grab the regular selection tool. I'm going to select the pocket on the right, delete it, and then select the two pieces of the pocket on the left. Now, I'm going to clone these and put them over here on the right. To do that, I'm going to go back over to the toolbox, come down not quite halfway, and you're going to find the rotate tool. If you click and hold on the rotate tool, it will reveal a menu here, and you can find the reflect tool. So we want to use the Reflect tool. I'm going to select that. And then I'm going to mouse over about midway of the backpack. So I'm going to use this oval here at the top of the backpack. I'm going to use the top of that oval as a center point. It might not be dead center, but it's pretty close. I'm going to hold down my Alt key. That's an Option key on the Mac. And click once. That will bring up a Reflect dialog. You're going to choose a vertical axis. And if you'd like, you can toggle on the preview, and you'll see what it's doing. It's, it's basically moving the pocket from the left side to the right side. And you see it's flipping the angle as well, so it's a mirrored image. But we don't want to just move it over there. We want to copy it, right? So that's why you have a Copy button here. So instead of hitting OK, hit Copy. And there you have it, a perfect mirrored image. 
Now, it's not lined up exactly right, so I'm going to use my right arrow key on my keyboard to nudge it one pixel to the right. Now, I'm going to zoom back out a little bit so we can see the final product here. I'm going to turn on the details layer. And I'm going to leave you with a little project here. So we have a top lid here on this frontmost pocket. And if I zoom out a little bit further, you'll see that the sample file, I have scalloped those edges as well. Figure out how you can take some other shapes, combine them with the dark rectangle that you have here, and use the Shape Builder tool to create that scalloped edge. Well, now that we've finished creating our graphics, it's time to export them in a format that our web developer can use to publish them to the website. So I'm going to start with the button document we created earlier. Now, in this document, we have multiple artboards representing the different states of our button. So let's go up to the File menu. And from the File menu, choose Export. Now you have multiple options here, and I'm going to start with the very last one here, Save for Web. Now with this option, you can only export the active artboard. And in our case, we have four of them. So I'd have to go through this process four different times. But if you look over on the right, you do have different presets over here. And that may help you select the type of output that you want. So if I come up here to the top, I can choose, well, let's say a JPEG or perhaps even a GIF. In the case of this graphic, the GIF would actually work out pretty well because our graphics are pretty much flat. There's not a lot of continuous tone colors or images in it, and there's no transparency. So the GIF would work out pretty well. And if I select the GIF 32, no dither, and then look down here in the lower left, I can see about how large this file will be when it's saved. And while it's 838 bytes, that's not bad. I think we can compress it a little bit more. We really don't need all of the colors that are being represented here. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see that there's a color table here. And there's lots of different greens and whites in here. I don't think we need that many. So I'm going to go up here into the options for the preset. And I'm going to reduce it from 32 to 8. My graphics really don't suffer from that. And I squeeze out just a few more bytes, about 200 or so. That looks pretty good. So I'll hit Save. Now, I'm going to navigate to my desktop, and on the desktop, I have an Assets folder, and that's just where I'm going to put all of our graphics here that we export. Now, let's go back up to the File menu and go back to Export. Now, the Export As option is, to me, not a very good option for exporting content for the web, so we're not going to bother with that one. We're going to instead jump up to the export for screens. Now, if you don't have the export for screens, that just means you're using an older version of Illustrator than I am. But this is a great option. So let's take a look at export for screens. Now, in this dialog box, we get some different options. And as you can see, the first option is the ability to export all of our artboards. And so you can see those listed here. And it's going to list them as Artboard 1, 2, 3, and 4. So if I export it now, it will use those names to name my buttons. And I don't want to do that. So I'm going to rename the first button here. Just double-click the name Artboard 1. I'll hit Enter to accept that name. And then I'm going to go ahead and rename the other artboards based on their content. With my artboards renamed now, I can choose which artboards I want to export. So you have these little check boxes here, and if I uncheck an artboard box, then it won't export that artboard. But I want all of them, so I'm going to go ahead and turn that back on. Well, now that I've got all of my artboards renamed, it's time to choose where they're going to be exported to. So over here on the right, we can see Export To, and I'm just going to verify where they're going. It's going on my desktop into that Assets folder. Now, if that's not the case, you can click on this folder icon to choose where you want to export your content. There's also an option here to open the location after the export. Now, just to simplify things here, I'm going to turn that off. But basically what it does is it just opens that folder or file location 
once you export it so that you can verify that all of your graphics have been exported. Now, a unique feature for the export for screens, and one of the reasons I like this so much is the fact that it will allow me to export multiple versions of my graphics. So you can see the formats down here. So I can add a scale and I can either change the scale of it or set it back to the exact same size. But then I can also export this as say a JPEG. So now I have multiple versions of the same document. Where this really comes in handy is when you are exporting content for standard screens and high DPI mobile devices. Right up here in the top right corner of the formats area, you have an iOS and Android. So what this is going to do is build out all of the different scale versions for these particular devices. Now, if I choose Android, you'll see that it builds out the various scales needed to publish to these devices. If I choose iOS, it will replace that with the iOS versions. So with the iOS, we have a few less pieces to export. We have a 1x standard size, 2x and 3x for the high definition or retina displays. And then we also have the SVG format. So with my different formats ready to go, I'm going to click export artboard. Now the export for screens command works great when you have multiple artboards. But what if you have a scenario where you have one artboard but multiple graphics? Well, let's take a look. I'm going to open up our complex shapes document that we completed earlier. And on here, I have one large artboard, but two different versions of the graphics. Now, I really just want to export the graphic that's on the left, the completed graphic. So if I go to File and I choose Export for Screens, up here at the top, it shows artboards. And we can see the little preview of both graphics. But there's also this thing called Assets. So I'm going to click on that. And there's nothing in here right now. And it's going to give me a little instruction as to what to do. Basically, I have to open up the Asset Export panel, and there is a link to do that. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to click this link. So that window will close, and over here on the right side of my screen, you will see the Asset Export panel. Now, to access this panel, you don't necessarily have to use that Export for Screens command. In fact, it sits right here in my interface. So it's just a panel that you can include in your... Uh, workspace and I like using it. So to use this all you have to do is select your graphics. So I'm just going to click and drag over this graphic here on the left and all it's going to get is the actual backpack which is fine for now and I'm just going to drag that over here into the uh, little preview area. So here's the first asset and I'm going to just call this one backpack. I'll hit enter to accept the name. Now if I go over to my layers panel and I unlock the background layer. Now when I select the backpack, I'm gonna get the circular frame that's around it too. And now I'm gonna drag that into the asset export and it creates a second copy. So I have one with the little background and one without. Just like the export for screens dialog box, you have the scale options down here so you can add them manually or you can choose the iOS or Android presets. So I'm going to choose the Android and go ahead and export all of those graphics. Now, it's going to pop open this dialog box. So it's wanting to know where I want to save these. And if I verify this here at the top, it's on the desktop in the assets folder. So I'll tell it select folder and it'll go ahead and start exporting those graphics. That brings us to a close on this module. So let's review what you've learned so far. We started creating our web graphics by defining a single Illustrator document that allowed us to build and compare our graphics during the design process. We created a simple yet elegant button graphic that can be repurposed throughout our website design. Then we added a text label to our button graphic using hosted fonts to ensure that our text looks great on every browser. We used tools exclusive to Adobe Illustrator that made creating more complex graphics a bit easier. And finally, we exported our graphics to hand off to our web developer using various methods available to us in Adobe Illustrator. You should now have a much better understanding of Adobe Illustrator's power as a web design tool. Now, keep in mind that we have only scratched the surface of what you can create with Illustrator. In the next module, we'll explore some.